basically, I was asked to give an overview about spinal balance. And it's kind of a change in direction from what you've heard for a lot of this morning, you know, a lot of things uh, about spinal oncology and different things. And this is something, um, either as a resident or a fellow, that you're going to be confronted with people who have uh, different, uh, different cases where spinal balance beca can become an issue. So what's going to happen is I'm going to do some basic concepts and I think what you're going to see, and, and in tomorrow's talk, you're going to see a is even more, uh, even a little greater detail, is how this concept of spinal balance, spinal realignment, is permeating the treatment of almost all spinal conditions, from cervical ones to lumbar degenerative ones to, uh, to other things. And, uh, and I think that it's really helping to change outcomes for the better. Uh, these are uh, my uh, different uh, disclosures. So basically, this is sort of a, a case example. Um, this was a 64-year-old principal uh, of, a, of a high school, and uh, he was uh, managed by uh, one of the guys who was several years behind me in, in training. And he had done four lumbar uh, uh, procedures on him. And what he said uh, to, 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 uh, to one of my friends is, Look at, you know, when I'm just sitting at my desk, uh, j uh, you know, doing nothing, my back doesn't really bother, very, bother me very much. But if I have to do something like, you know, walk across the auditorium for an assembly or walk across a football field, I have terrible back pain and I cannot stand for more than five minutes at a cocktail party. I cannot go to the mall and walk between stores because my back and my legs hurt me so bad. So what happened was the, uh, the, the surgeon that operated on him did a CT myelogram. And again, you can see in that one cut, that's kind of the worst one. There's maybe a little bit of foraminal narrowing. But in, in, in his mind, there was nothing that was causing him such horrific back pain. So what's happening is these were his x-rays that I got when I went and uh, looked at this patient. And you're going to see in, in, a, in a minute that this guy really has a very, very substantial deformity. And if you're somebody who's just basing your treatment plans on an MRI scan or on the CT myelogram, you, you would miss this. And you can see there, for example, you know, this is a, a guy in his 60s. He has absolutely no thoracic kyphosis, right? So this guy is somebody that is really, really working extraordinarily hard to go and stand in an upright posture. And this is uh, what I ended up uh, eventually doing uh, for him to be able to go and realign his spine. And he had a, a dramatic improvement of his symptoms. So what we've begun to realize over the last 10 or 15 years, that the alignment of the spine and the uh, relationship between the spine and the pelvis has a pretty profound uh, influence over outcomes. And again, this was something that gradually came into recognition, particularly for those people who as, uh, as uh, children or, or adolescents had treatment with Harrington rods. And the, with the Harrington rod treatment, a lot of people lost the, uh, the, uh, the contour of their spine in the sagittal plane. And what was found is these people got older and their ability to compensate for that loss of lordosis in particular, that they became more uh, symptomatic. So what happens is that for, for, for each of us, we begin to have degenerative changes of the spine as we age. And some loss of lumbar lordosis is almost universal as, uh, as, as people age. And what happens is there's some people, as this uh, process occurs, who develop kind of a stable uh, you know, kind of ankylosis of the spine or spondylosis of the spine. But there's also some people who develop uh, a, a progressive deformity. And you're going to see a little bit in the talk, those people who uh, become symptomatic from it and those people who don't and the reasons for it. So these people develop things like uh, spondylolisthesis and scoliosis. So what's happening is, is that this was an initial study by a guy named Frank Schwab. And what he went to say is, are any x-ray parameters that were really strongly correlated with people who had spinal deformity who had symptoms? And what happened was, and I, this paper was kind of underappreciated at the time, but what they found was that those people, the single biggest uh, uh, correlate to people becoming symptomatic were those people who had a loss of lumbar lordosis. There were other factors that were associated with it. But at that time, and this is back around uh, 2000, 
a lot of people thought very similar to the, what they were finding treating idiopathic scoliosis in, in, in adolescents was they thought things that, like the severity of the curve, you know, the, the magnitude of it, uh, you know, things like that, which were going to be the principal driver of symptoms. But what it found was is that the Cobb angle and the patient's age actually had almost no, had no correlation with symptoms, and normal lordosis was really, really a strong correlate. And what they found was, in particular, a subgroup of patients who actually um, developed a uh, lumbar or thoracic lumbar kyphosis were the ones who were the most symptomatic. So this is uh, sort of a typical patient. This is one of mine that I treated some years ago. But basically, you can see 76 years old, has got a 31-degree coronal pain scoliosis, clearly a degenerative, uh, degenerative pattern for it. But you can see how the patient has almost no lumbar lordosis, in fact, has a thracolumbar junctional kyphosis. And you can see the patient has an ODI of 54, showing that she is fairly symptomatic. And you can see some of the reasons, you know, this interplay between loss of lumbar lordosis is often associated with people having more advanced spondylitic disease, in this case, pretty significant foraminal stenosis as well. And this is, uh, at least at that time, a very typical operation that I did. And the patient had an ODI of 14 after this procedure. And you can see that the parameters uh, became uh, closer to what you'll see as normative values. So what's happening is, is why people become symptomatic as they lose their lumbar lordosis is in general, uh, the body has a tendency to pitch forward as this lumbar lordosis is lost. And each of us has a, a, a sort of a cone of economy that, that, that basically, you know, that's why, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, bipedal, uh, bipedal uh, animals that we're able to stand, you know, for an hour or two hours, uh, you know, standing in the operating room, some of us for six or eight hours uh, during, during case is because if, you're, if your alignment is very good, there's very little energy that's expended to be able to stand in this upright posture. But if you get out of alignment and particularly being pitched forward, the energy expenditure that it needs to stand upright becomes uh, very, very large. So uh, this was another kind of landmark study by uh, Steve, uh, Steve Glassman. And what they found was is if you drop the plumb line from the middle of the seventh vertebrae, that ideally, and in young people, asymptomatic young people, that plumb line generally passed through the, uh, the, the posterior aspect of the L5-S1 disc. And what was found was, is, is you go and you shift this plumb line forward, again, principally due to the loss of lumbar lordosis, that people become progressively uh, more symptomatic. And you can see the reasonably tight correlation between this uh, what's called positive sagittal balance and the amount of symptoms. Now, here's a little bit more extreme of a case, but here's a patient <coughs> who has loss of lumbar lordosis, but also developed some uh, proximal junctional failure, but the resultant, uh, resultant combination resulted in this severe sagittal imbalance. ODI is 72, showing that this person is very severely symptomatic. And again, by restoring this back to a normal level, by in this case doing a, a subtraction osteotomy and some other, uh, uh, other uh, osteotomies with this, that the patient is, is relatively uh, minimally symptomatic following completion of the procedure. Now, what's happening is, is that when people looked at the sagittal uh, vertical axis, um, when, the, when they went and correlated with people having symptoms, they correlated reasonably well. And a lot of the cor correlations found that it correlated with symptoms to about, about 60%. But they recognized that there was a component of, uh, of something that was missing. So beginning in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, the French started looking at the relationship between the spine and the pelvis. And for a long period of time, people just you know, thought that this was kind of a wacky way out there, way out there uh, 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 thing. But over time, there was an increasing realization that this relationship between the spine and pelvis really uh, was, was the missing piece, you know, the other 40% of relationships as far as why people, were symptom, why people were symptomatic. So if you look at this scatter plot right here, this is the, uh, the correlation between lumbar lordosis for a young adult and their uh, pelvic incidence. And I think probably most of you know what the pelvic incidence is now. I'll show you a, sort of a brief slide. But the pelvic incidence, in essence, is how your 
uh, your pelvis, uh, your, your, your spine fits into your pelvis. And some people have a very vertical relationship, other people have a more horizontal relationship, and, uh, and that is the driver ultimately for how much lumbar lordosis an individual needs. So what's happening is, as you can see, uh, these are the different parameters. The pelvic incidence is a morphological parameter. That's what happens, uh, you know, how you're basically made. And this is something once you reach skeletal maturity, it doesn't change very much, uh, very, very little uh, drift with time. There's something called the pelvic tilt, which we're going to discuss in more detail. And the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt are kind of reciprocal aspects of kind of the same thing. And they measure the body's ability to compensate as you start to begin to lose lumbar lordosis. So what's happening is, is the pelvic incidence is a morphological parameter. It's not affected by patient position. There's minimal variation in time in the adult population. And that shows you how you measure that pelvic incidence. And what happens no matter how you move, no matter how you twist, that pelvic incidence stays the, stays the same. Now what happens is those people who have a small pelvic incidence naturally as young adults have much less lumbar lordosis. And, and those people who have a more horizontal sacrum need to have much more, uh, much more uh, lordosis in the lumbar spine. Now those people who are kind of unfortunate enough to have a very big pelvic incidence, there's been associations between pel high pelvic incidence and things like spondylolisthesis because there's much larger shear forces across the lower lumbar spine. And it's also been associated with, uh, with, uh, with higher incidence of idiopathic scoliosis. Now what happens is overall the lumbar lordosis and the pelvic incidence should match each other within about, within about 10 degrees. And you're going to see in a, in, in a few slides that the bigger that drift apart becomes, the more likely someone is to become symptomatic. So what's happening is I was involved in something called the International Spine Study Group. And what we did is we looked at patients. And some of this stuff here, you know, it, it's so widely believed. But at the time, this was something that was thought just to be kind of a crazy out there concept. <laughs> So what we started doing was looking at groups of patients, first 125, and then almost 500, and then 1,000 patients, correlating between what factors cause people to be symptomatic. And as you're going to see following that, what factors, if we correct things appropriately, are associated with the best outcomes. So what we did is, is we wanted to figure out what the pain and, pain and, and, and disability generators are. Now, in, uh, nine, in 2005, the uh, Scoliosis Research Society had a group to go and try to come up with a classification for adult scoliosis. And basically, at that time, they had 42 different parameters that this, this complex classification had. Well, no one was going to calculate 42 different things. And the fact is, the vast majority of them had absolutely no relationship with, uh, with, with symptoms. So what happened in the results of this is what we found was there were certain uh, threshold parameters where people became, uh, became symptomatic. So what happened was is that we ended up finding uh, several factors that were tremendously highly correlated with being symptomatic uh, with, 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 with degenerative conditions of the, uh, of the spine. So the most important was is the relationship between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis. And the correlation with this is really, really high. I mean, way higher than the sagittal vertical axis. And what we found was is that basically the more you drifted apart from having your lumbar lordosis match your pelvic incidence, the more symptomatic you were going to become. The second one was uh, how sagittally imbalanced you were, and that could be measured by either the SVA, which we just described, in Europe, there's a tendency to use something called the T1 tilt, which is an angular measurement, and you don't need to go and actually uh, calibrate your films to, to, to correlate uh, with this. And this was the second most important parameter. Then finally, the uh, pelvic tilt. This is how much you're retroverting your pelvis. Uh, uh, this also correlated uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with symptoms, but not to quite as high a degree. And again, this just shows that relationship. So basically, uh, so basically what was found was is that as you went and had higher and higher values from normative levels, the more symptomatic uh, people, uh, people, uh, people were. 
Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, why do you do adult deformity surgery? And I'll discuss some techniques of that tomorrow. But the fact is, is that it is something that really impacts people in a negative way. This is a study, this thing just got, just got published. But basically what this found was, is comparing people who had these abnormalities in alignment and seeing how big of symptoms they had. And what was found here is that if you have a sagittal vertical axis of more than 10 centimeters positive, um, this is the single most disabling. These are all different conditions that have from things like severe congestive heart failure to having pancreatic cancer to having, having, uh, uh, having uh, um, severe rheumatoid arthritis. And what it was found was is that if you were sagittally imbalanced to that degree, it is the single most disabling uh, condition uh, uh, listed in, 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 the, in, the, in the SF36. And it's equivalent to having bilateral above knee amputations as far as the level of disability. And that's why if we treat people and why I've got, you know, a six month backlog into, into me doing surgery that, you know, that you can really make profound differences. Again, this is, this is, this is kind of an example. This was somebody who was eventually referred to me. This was a, uh, this was about a, a 28 year old kid. And he started off having a really crappy operation for a burst fracture. And he got reoperated on and reoperated on and reoperated on. And he'd had about a total of about 10 different surgeries on him by the time he was sent to me. Now, this kid, uh, you know, spent his life uh, sitting in his parents' basement, I think smoking pot, um, and basically didn't work, didn't have a girlfriend, didn't do anything. It was just a complete drain on society. So, uh, so basically his parents dragged him in. I think they wanted him out of the basement. And so, uh, so I went and saw him and just as an example, you can see what it looked like after these, and again, multiple level pseudarthrosis, even at the level where he was treated with a burst fracture, hadn't healed. And basically just by realigning him like that, um, his ODI is 22. He's now employed. He's like a stock analyst. He's in his mid thirties right now. I probably would have done a little bit better job than I did, uh, than I did back then. But just to show you that you can make just absolutely profound differences by changing someone back to more normal values as far as their spinal pelvic parameters and their spinal balance. So basically this was a, a study looking at this. This initially was theoretical and this was a prospective study that we did through the ISSG uh, looking, at, looking at this. And, and we eventually came up with a classification. This is the current SS, SRS classification for adult deformity. And basically what it shows is by using those parameters we discussed, these are used as modifiers. And what happens is, is that it's been shown very with a high correlation that as you go up the modifier uh, uh, severity, the, the patient's symptoms increase. So this has uh, resulted in a, a, uh, a, the development of alignment objectives. And what we generally want to do, at least for younger patients, is to try to have an ideal alignment with the SVA less than five centimeters, the pelvic tilt less than 25 degrees, and the lumbar lordosis proportional to the pelvic incidence. So, uh, so basically, uh, so basically, what happened with this study was if we are able to achieve those goals, how does it do? And this study showed very, uh, very, uh, you know, show, showed really uh, strongly that if you can return people to normative values, that they do very, very well after the different surgeries that are, have been performed. Now, what happened was it used to be thought that you only should operate on people if they were very, very pitched forward. This is a study by my partner, Justin Smith, that we, uh, we looked at things. And what we found was, uh, uh, was that basically that there's some people who have good enough muscle quality that they can go and significantly retroverse their, pe retroverse their pelvis and straighten their, thoracic, uh, stra straighten their thoracic kyphosis. And these people are also expending huge amounts of energy and also benefit from surgery. And this is one of the cases, this is one of my cases that they used uh, for this paper's case example. And again, Somebody whose SVA looks pretty normal, but if you look at it, the patient's severely retroverting their pelvis, and by correcting them, uh, the patient became much less symptomatic. Now, what's happening is I've shown you that this is really true for deformity. I think almost everybody uh, uh, agrees and believes this. This is sort of the mantra now for adult deformity, but the question is, does this still hold true for lesser conditions? Do we care as much? 
And what's happening was when I was a, uh, a resident, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people, in, particularly in the field of neurosurgery, didn't believe you needed to do a fusion if you did an anterior cervical discectomy. People would frequently take out one, two, or three discs and put them in a collar, and a, and a lot of times it would collapse down. But a lot of these people, over time, eventually drifted into kyphosis in the cervical spine. It was gradually, there was a realization that by losing cervical lordosis, you probably could get rid of it. You, you, know, probably, you could probably make up for it for one level, but if you had multiple levels, that, that was potentially going to be problematic. And that's why most people do anterior cervical discectomies, fusion, and plating now to get around that. So similarly, most people thought, well, if you're just going to do a one or two level fusion in the lumbar spine, there's enough ability to compensate that it really doesn't matter. And you're going to see that it, it really does, that there's an increasing body of evidence showing that even for one and two level surgeries, um, that it has, has an impact. So basically, this was a thing looking at people who had a laminectomy for spinal stenosis. And you know, it used to be thought, ah, if someone has bad spinal stenosis, all you need is a laminectomy, everybody's gonna do well. And what they found was, is that they, when they looked, uh, looked, they found that there were, uh, there were groups of patients who did really well, and there's patients who did really poorly. And the people who did really poorly after a laminectomy alone for spinal stenosis were those who had a profound, or had a significant loss of lumbar lordosis. And if you look at the details of this paper and look at the, 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 the values, people that had more than 15, uh, 15 degree mismatch between their pelvic incidence and their lumbar lordosis did terribly with a laminectomy alone. This is another study looking sort of on the similar thing. This was, uh, this was looking at people with, again, spinal stenosis. And what they found was that, that spinal imbalance, loss of lumbar lordosis, and in this case, high BMI were all associated with uh, greater symptoms. This is another paper looking at spinal stenosis. Again, loss of SVA and lumbar lordosis and loss of lumbar lordosis strongly correlated with increased pain and poor function in those people who are, uh, who are treated. Um, this is, again, the details from that analysis for the paper. And this is, I think, kind of a classic example. This is a patient who, as you see, that I treated, came in here with profound inability to stand up and ambulate. And so what's happening is, at least the classic kind of neurosurgical dictum was, what the reason why this patient can't uh, walk is because they've got pretty bad spinal stenosis. And they did have pretty bad spinal stenosis. There's no doubt about that, okay? Uh, but if you also look, you can see when they, uh, uh, maybe I, I may or may not put the CT scan in this, but basically these patients also had a number of kind of vacuum discs that gapped open when they laid down for their, for their, for their CT scan. And what happened, what's happening is, is that frequently what I will do is get an x-ray with the patient seated to see if that somehow or other, you know, that people say, well, they may be losing their lumbar lordosis and the ability to try to compensate their bodies trying to open their spinal canal. But if they're seated, uh, that, 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 that should uh, take that away. And if they still have a profound loss of lumbar lordosis, then these people are the ones who truly have a coexisting deformity along with their spinal stenosis. There it is. So you can see those kind of vacuum phenomena in the area. And you can see even with the patient's supine, there's a loss of lumbar lordosis. And so because of that, here are the long cassette x-rays. You can see the markedly increased pelvic retroversion. You can see, again, this flattened thoracic spine. And, uh, and uh, there are all the different measurements for it. And this is what I ended up doing for that patient. Now, some people, uh, my, my former chairman would have said that's, a, that's overkill. But the fact is I follow all my patients for years afterwards, and this person just did extraordinarily well. And I would make the case that this is a patient that had a real underlying deformity rather than just purely being spinal stenosis. These are some things looking at ismic spondylolisthesis. Again, showed improvement of lumbar lordosis and pelvic tilt are the most important things for the treatment of ismic spondylolisthesis. And again, from that, from that paper, here's another one uh, looking at the same type of thing for ismic spondylolisthesis that basically those people who do not get a good restoration of lumbar lordosis and uh, spinal balance do more poorly, again, uh, from, that, uh, from that paper. Now, David, I think, has that paper come out yet, the thing about if you don't restore lordosis, is that finally? We are getting a portrait about every year with, with, with comments that make absolutely no sense. Yeah, and There are two different papers, one that just got published, uh, which showed a 10-time higher 
revision rate and those people who have the, the one that just got published, one or two level fusions who do not have good restoration of lumbar lordosis. And David had presented uh, a similar series showing almost exactly the same thing. Okay. So the last thing is, is we, you know, I've been one of the ones for years, sort of driving this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this need for restoration of normative values. And the fact is, is we've driven this harder and harder and harder. What we found was, particularly in elderly patients, that you suddenly have the unintended consequence of these people beginning to fall off on top and develop uh, proximal junctional failure. So because of this, we've started to relook at things. And, and some of the alignment criteria, I'm going to show you in this last little part of the, of the talk, are dependent upon age, bone quality, and the patient's uh, uh, muscular envelope. So what happens is, is that this is a patient that I operated on, again, several years ago, 84-year-old, generally good health, who was very, very active until about two years ago when she started developing increasing lower back pain and lower extremity radicular pain and neurogenic claudication. You can see why she has neurogenic claudication because of the severity of her, of, of her stenosis. Well, she's 84 and some people would call into question, should I operate on her or not? And that's another debate, but I decided to operate on her and I did this operation right here. And what, and what happened was we showed this in conference, you know, some of my colleagues said, boy, you know, you didn't get that lordosis. You know, if you see here, her SVA is about six centimeters and her, you know, her lumbar lordosis, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a 14 degree mismatch. You didn't get her less than 10. You really didn't do a good job. So the question was, is that an undercorrected or is that an age appropriate uh, for her? And you can see she, these are x-rays two years after I did the surgery and she doesn't have PJK I and mean, she didn't fall off on top. So, so the question is, here's another one here, uh, a person here who had a, a lumbar fusion's been done. You can see, you know, really very, uh, very uh, significant loss of lumbar lordosis. And I ended up doing this operation. Again, it was, I was called into question about, did I really undercorrect this patient or was it appropriate? If you look at all the values, I didn't get them all back to a, a, a level that would do, but her ODI is 13, she didn't PJK. And the fact is, is, is should we be doing something different for elder patients? So what's happening is we clearly know as people become older and older, their alignment changes and people are more sagittally, uh, sagittally uh, uh, canted. They, you know, their SVA does increase as they age. It's clear that lumbar lordosis is almost universal in people that are older than 60 years old. And so what's happening is this study here found that the SVA is generally about 40 uh, millimeters uh, positive and the people that are between 70 and 85. And, and, and what's happening is, is that there's a realization as we're starting to use things like EOS that alignment, may, that C7 may not be the perfect area to measure what the alignment should be. So this is out of the Northwestern group. Tyler Koski will be here tonight. But what they started looking at is using the, uh, the, the cranial center of mass as a measurement for things. And you can see here, they went and looked at that and a bunch of, uh, uh, of uh, volunteers, what they found was that all these, all these measures drifted forward. And if you look in asymptomatic uh, people that are older than 70, there's a general rule that the center of the mass of the head if you drop a plumb line for that, it passes through the center of the hip joint. And that correlates really highly for people who are asymptomatic. So uh, this is another uh, study out of Japan looking at the same things. Again, they're talking about the cranial center of gravity, which is essentially the same thing. And what, again, they found was that this does drift forward, but what happens for asymptomatic older patients that this correlation runs very highly to go through the center of the uh, joint of the hips. So, so what's happening is within the ISSG, we went and uh, looked at that. And what we found was, is as you become older, what is ideal changes, okay? So this is something using the, something called a T1 pelvic angle. 
Uh, it's a thing that takes into consideration both the SVA and the pelvic tilt. And what they found was, is if you, if you look at the different parameters, this is the T1 pelvic angle. What we found was that, is that, is that what's ideal, again, slowly increases as we get age and is particularly different in those patients older than 70. So what's happening is, as I started looking at back on patients that I ended up having problems with PJK and those who did not have, a, did not have PJK. And so when you talk about the T1 pelvic angle, basically for those people that are under 40, you really want to get that TPA under, uh, you know, under, under 15, maybe under 12. As you get older, the values begin to change. So this is again, a, a, an elderly patient. And what happened is the T1, uh, the, 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 the TPA was 18. And for somebody at this age, this person was actually ideally aligned. And if you look at the, if you look at the, the blue line that goes, her, her balance was right through the center of her hip joint. So I did this case here, okay, and I really tried to go and get perfect, uh, perfect uh, lordosis matching with the pelvic incidence. And the fact is I drove, if you, if you went and looked things, I put her center of gravity head, of her head way behind her hip joints. And she automatically just fell forward to get to where she ideally wanted to be. So what happens is this is big PJK, which put her where her body really wanted to end up anyway. And trying to drive this thing you know, to, to an artificial level of what you do when a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old or even a 50-year-old had an untimely consequences of her really wanting to come back to where she was. So basically, this is again looking, uh, looking at a variety of different things. What we found was is that, is that what we want is different. So what happens is for people who are elderly, these are greater than 75 years old, probably normal is a pelvic tilt somewhere, you know, it says 28 degrees. The lumbar lordosis pelvic mismatch is probably somewhere around 16 degrees. And the SVA may even be as much as eight centimeters positive. And this shows you all the different specifics. And these are thresholds based upon the amount of symptoms that they have. So with this, again, here's somebody with a TPA of 33. You know, you know that, is, that is too much. When we get back here, probably the, you know, probably the, the, uh, you know, the, the TPA should be somewhere around 20 is if you look at the, look at the, look at the values, uh, look at the values here. So what happens, 33 is too much, but what I did is I way overdid it. Instead of getting them back to somewhere around 20, I made it 12 and guess what happens? The patient falls over because she wants again, get her center of mass from her head through the center of her hip joints and I got it, I did it too far. Here's somebody again with, 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 with 20. And again, what I did is I, I, I kept it around 20 where she should be. And you're gonna see some cases as we move forward and forward. So independently, as I kind of figured this is out, this is from uh, Larry Lanky and his group. And what they basically found was the exact same thing. For people older than 65, if you end up putting the center of the mass of the head through the center of the hip joint, you're gonna end up having a very low incidence of PJK and have the patients really do exceedingly well. So again, TPA of 41, way too high, get it around 20. And again, this is a patient uh, that's in their 70s, no PJK, good results. Again, 39, get it back around 20, no PJK with good results. So basically, uh, so basically, I just wanted to give you an overview. This is kind of a sort of an advanced course in spinal balance. But basically, but basically, it's important to recognize that even simple degenerative conditions have an association of spinal uh, malalignment. It's important to understand what normal is and how things change o o over time. And if you're going to think about doing a fusion, I think probably a tight come point is, I think it's really important. If I'm going to fuse anybody, they're getting 36 inch films to be able to assess what their spinal alignment is, even if I'm going to do a simple fusion. As you can see, you want to be cautious about corrections of lumbar lordosis greater than 30 degrees, particularly for anybody that is older than 60. You, uh, you, uh, you, know, you want to be, uh, you know, if you have somebody where you're going to do a big correction, you may want to consider going up to the upper thoracic spine. And the targets for the uh, deformity LD are TPA between 15 and 25 and SVA between 4 and 7. If you do that, you'll have a much lower failure rate. Thank you. Thank you.